And please check the chat for instructions on our simultaneous Spanish translation, which is being offered tonight. Um, and as well, uh, you can put questions in the chat throughout. Um, thank you, Joel. So uh, tonight we have um, some wonderful guests um, and we are offering this event in conjunction with the Santa Monica Public Library. So we have Karen Wrights here to give us a little bit of information about library programs and how they connect with this project. Please take it away, Karen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's so great to be a part of this tonight. Uh, like Naomi was saying, I am here from the library. I oversee adult and neighborhood services for the library. So that is a little bit of everything. Uh, those of you that are not familiar with the library and our programming, we do lots <laughs> and lots of partnering like this, which is really important in terms of uh, community and community outreach. Um, so we have a calendar of events, visual calendar of events <laughs> that comes out every month. Uh, it also can be found on our website, which is smpl.org. I can put that in the chat. Uh, we have a number of programs going on for Women's History Month, uh, which is March. And I think you all know, but maybe you didn't, but today's International Women's Day. We had a great program today focusing on online resources that feature women and uh, history of women in industry. Uh, we also are showing a film uh, on March 23rd at our Pico branch. If you haven't seen it yet, I haven't. It's supposed to be absolutely amazing. Um, the Woman King. Uh, we'll be showing that and we'll have a speaker talking about women uh, in film. Uh, Elena Archer, who oversees the Mary Picture Foundation, will be speaking. Uh, she also is a, a filmmaker herself. Uh, we have a couple other, just briefly, a couple other programs. I always have to do the plugs. Uh, we have a Stop Senior Scams program on March 22nd. Um, that's actually an acting program that does role play. Uh, and we have a Pi Day program on March 14th. Uh, we have kits for the public called Red Kits. Read, Engage, Discover. It's a new collection at the library. And we have a pie making kit amongst other things. So we're, uh, we're rolling out that kit on March 14th for the program. So again, all these programs can be found on the library's website, smpl.org. Um, and I think I'll just let you all take it away because you have a lot of important things to discuss. I'll go ahead and have uh, Joel Garcia kick it off. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Joel Garcia, as, as Karen shared. Um, I'm part of the facilitation team alongside Rostin, who's here joining us, and Robin, who will be assisting me today. Um, before we start off, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, we're coming to you from different parts of LA County, um, homelands of the Tangwa, Chumash, the Taviam, and the Hashiman peoples. And we got guests from New York, um, from Lenape Hawking Territory, Territory and Christine, who's joining us from the Bay Area Ohlone Territory. Um, today, our, our program is titled Memory Work To Do. What we hope to do from this, you know, from this session is um, give you all a, you know, kind of a full spectrum of activities, solutions, strategies, whatever you want to call them that are taking place across um, not just this country, but all over the country, um, all over the continent, in regards to community-driven ideas and solutions to um, this work that you know is being called like memory work, civic memory, and whatnot. Um, and so that's our goal for today: that we can show you a wide breadth of of tools and and resources that you can use for um, talking about the places you grew up in, the your family's legacies when it comes to living here in this place that we call the US, Los Angeles, Santa Monica, et cetera. Um, if anybody is, before I forget, if, if anybody's joining us and needs Spanish interpretation, um, si alguien está aquí y ocupa interpretación en español, el icono abajo um, del, del globo lo puede um, agregar y puede, um, pues, eh, puede, um, Oí la interpretación de parte de Aldo. Um, si ocupa más in instrucciones, por favor, de comunicarse por el chat y nos avisa y nosotros nos... nos ahí hay, vemos cómo le podemos ayudar. Um, so I just kind of give Spanish interpretation for a quick minute. Um, 
we do want to make sure that the chat is active. So we'll be dropping in a lot of information in regards to the programming, um, any resources and tools that we offer. This is being recorded, as you all know. So we'll then make this, you know, this video available to you all to come back and, you know, kind of just review and um, take in some of the information that both Idris and Christina share with you, along with the um, from our team as well. Um, so before we get going, um, just want to do a couple quick introductions. If Robin, you want to kind of raise your hand, I guess, and you know, say who you are. Uh, I know Rossin's here joining us as a participant, but you know, feel free to like share who you are with folks so they know mm -hmm. who to reach out to afterwards. Um, Robin. Hey everyone, I'm Robin Garcia, and I'm part of the um, uh, Metsley Projects Refer Reframe Facilitation Team. Um, I'm going to be working with Hoel today and kind of facilitating this conversation with you all. Rostin, did you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Hi, I'm Rostin. Um, I'm an artist. I'm part working with this team as well. Um, as people probably know, this is like a many months process. This is our you know second or third public event, and we're just really happy to have um, you all here with us. And I'm a little bit sick, so if for whatever reason um, I'm speaking a little bit low, please feel free to tell me to like speak a little bit louder. Um, we also have folks from the working circle here. So if you all just kind of want to give an emoji, thumbs up or heart, and to kind of just signal to folks that you're part of the working circle, um, please do so. Uh, we want to give you all a shout out for all the work that you're doing alongside this, this team. Awesome, we have a lot of folks here, great. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Robin to kind of share a little bit about um, the reframe process and I'll be dropping some links in the chat. Thanks, Hawel. And um, just so you know, my you might hear my son in the background. So <laughs> if you hear some squealing or something, that's just the six-year-old running around. Um, but yeah, I'm just um, I'm excited to be here with everybody. I'll just give a quick introduction to um, what we're doing um, through the reframe process and kind of our framework that we've been using, a little bit about the programming, and then we'll kind of jump into framing the conversation for today. Um, so as many of you already know, Reframe is an initiative through the city of Santa Monica to really think about how to center stories of folks who've kind of been excluded from a lot of the narratives um, that have taken place in public art and kind of cultural production conversations. Um, and specifically, we're looking at the mural in City Hall, um, the WPA era mural, and thinking about um, how the representations of the mural have impacted communities in Santa Monica and how we can make an intervention in that impact. Um, so we have a series of programs that we've been doing. This is one of them. We've um, we've had, uh, before today, we had a an event um, that kind of introduced the feedback activity guide, which we'll talk about later on, which is a small little curriculum for folks to kind of engage students or other kinds of people interested in um, that event was specifically about students, but just folks in thinking about how, what kind of intervention would you make in the kind of representations that the mural has. And um, what we're gonna be doing is using the feedback from that activity guide um, to write a report to um, the city about what, uh, with some recommendations on how to move forward in terms of how do we reframe the conversation? Should there be another commission? Um, what kind of programming needs to take place, et cetera, and kind of really thinking about um, how to address the um, the impact that the mural has had um, on is specifically people of color and working class communities. Um, so, and then, you know, we have had a few other events. Um, we're gonna have one on April 1st, which is a story uh, circle, which is kind of a critical listening exercise and, and storytelling workshop led by um, Anu Yadav, who's a theater artist. Um, that'll be open to the public and really exciting. Um, and then our Working Circle members are also gonna be having some events in their communities. Um, and there'll be another event taking place, which we'll announce later on, but everything's also on the, on the website, which folks can check out um, and take part of. And also we wanna welcome everybody to use the feedback activity guide and share it out with as many people as you can, because the more feedback we get, the more robust our report and recommendations can be to the city. Um, so I think uh, the link was dropped 
in the chat. So feel free to kind of uh, look at it and use it and um, share it out with anyone. And, and we welcome, you know, your feedback and, and um, comments and, and participation. Um, and so just kind of, that's kind of like, you know, the reframe project, but I'll talk to just really briefly about this event today and why, why is it relevant and why is it important? And as Howell mentioned, you know, across the country and all over the world, there have been conversations that have been having, having happening around um, how memory um, is held in public space, um, how complicated, contested, traumatic memories are represented, um, and how can we make interventions in those kinds of memories. And we know in our own country that there has been this tidal wave of folks who have been taking down statues, things that have been um, you know, from Confederate monuments, pe people that have been calling into question representations of history that no longer resonate with the narratives and stories of people um, that need to be at the forefront of those conversations now. Um, and we know in Los Angeles as well that there's been um, a huge conversation around this in many different spaces. Um, in, uh, what was it, in 2019, the Columbus statue in Grand Park um, was taken down after a long process um, where the Native American Indian Commission pushed the county to address um, the impact of that statue on Native communities and um, the representation that it held inside the center of Los Angeles says, you know, um, and so finally, after a long period of time um, and a, a huge process, it was taken down. And there has been a lot of dis different conversations happening across Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, Santa Monica, around representations, public art, and um, really thinking about how do we t retell the stories of our cities, of our of our municipalities, in a way that honors the histories of everybody who's um, living there, and are the representations that are there now doing that right? And if not, what do we do um, to change that conversation? So this is part of that kind of conversation, and the the folks who are going to talk uh, with us today have done work in this area, so we're really excited um, to hear from them. And I think now we're just gonna kind of look over this resource that um, has been put together um, that's called Monuments Revisited. And I'll just kind of hand it over to Howell to um, look at that. Howell, you're muted. <laughs> Again, like if you need me to um, enlarge the screen and the font, please let me know. Um, we put together this this list of projects and efforts from across um, the continent, really, the primarily from the U.S. So um, there's three that I want to cover really quick. I think one is. Um, Monument Lab as a whole is a is an entity out in in Philadelphia that has really been in the, at the forefront of a lot of this work. Um, they've done the work from the bottom up, meaning from directly bringing together artists, community members, um, and I think what's made their work really su successful is that they found a way to um, bring in every sector, whether it's government, whether it's students, professors. Um, they managed to figure out what that um, what that bridge needs to that, that yeah the bridge in between um, communities. I think that for me the most important part and re what I really love about what they do is that they focus on language and building language because I know a lot of times we're all saying the same things and we're all meaning and have the same intentions, but sometimes the language that we use in order to describe our experiences and whatnot is where a lot of like you know, the clumsiness in, in conversation happens. Um, and so they're, you know, they're very much like me, they're word nerds. And so shifting a word in a sentence somewhere else or switching it for something else that is, you know, um, that is more generative or, or might even allude to other frameworks, like even just the idea of care has made their work really, really transformational. And one of the big things that they did in the last couple of years is, is put together this regeneration project um, and they selected 10 projects from across the country from, as you can see, from Alabama, 
to Arizona, here in Los Angeles, a team that I am part of, um, St. Louis, Queens, Philadelphia, and really across many multiple communities, right? Like the native communities, the, um, the Filipino community in, in New York. Um, and some of these topics you've heard in the news, right? Like, you know, the issues with boarding schools, um, the folks, the work that's happening in, up in um, West Virginia through Courage in the Hollers, to me, it's really super interesting because it, it talks to the history of unions in, in the US and um, how contentious that has been even now, right? Um, a lot of beautiful work taking place. Um, some of this goes beyond what we think is, is just, you know, centered around monuments and, and these memorials, but really go into the idea that some of these efforts um, are also um, impacting how communities, specifically like native communities are helping revitalize some language, are helping re revitalize cultural practices, specifically because a lot of those cult cultural practices are connected to land, land that in many cases they don't have access to. Um, and so this has been creating a lot of access through the interrogation of history and memorials and monuments and whatnot. So a lot of really good work. Um, the other piece that is very much, um, I love because it's just, so um, ingenious and like just the way it approached this whole process. Free uh, Agunfemi is, um, you know, she began doing this work by herself, a woman out in Richmond, Virginia, a black woman out in Richmond, Virginia, uh, which we all know when, you know, got the spotlight when um, there was these gatherings in opposition to the Confederate monument removals. Um, you know, with the tiki torches and all that stuff, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but Free um, found some loopholes in, in, in some of the ordinances um, in the city and discovered that if she added any type of um, placard that added context to any public art, that it became part of the city infrastructure, even if it was her just as a community member doing so. And so it protected the added context to, to these pieces. And she did it with statues, she did it with other plaques, and just, you know, added her own, her own take on things, and not her own take on things, but the work she did alongside community, um, everything from barcodes that led to oral histories, um, to information that led to videos, and really uplifted the um, the history of Richmond, Virginia, the Black history of Richmond, Virginia, so much so that her work now is is um, is a model for other communities. The funny thing is that um, in this instance, the Historical Society for Richmond um, really was in opposition of her work, and she's currently the president of the Richmond, Virginia Historical Society. So just like the whole growth and trajectory there is is beautiful. That like. What began as, as an effort by not just herself, but a, a handful of community members has now been absorbed into what the city is doing as a way to um, rewrite, you know, the history that that they've been told is, is accurate, which is not. The other project that we want to highlight alongside Monument Lab and, and Untold RVA is um, an artist project by Guadalupe Rosales, who's, who's here from Los Angeles. Um, and it began because she did not see herself and her experience reflected in popular culture, especially when it came to um, what was going on here in LA in the late 90s around um, youth culture. So she began just kind of collecting these images um, of friends and photos from, um, from events and gatherings and, be, and put together the Instagram profile and very quickly just blew up. Um, and what it's done up until now, it's become a model for a lot of other communities to take ownership over their own, um, I mean, you could call it like, you know, just their own family photo book. Um, and, you know, where we see, we, we might see some something when it comes to youth and images, like even if they're just like partying, there's there's a lot of history there. A lot of, a lot of um, I would say, for those of us who lived through those moments, to get to tell the stories of how these systems impacted us as youth and be able to use that um, even for um, things like policy change has been has been incredible. So um, for folks who might know, Los Angeles County as a whole, and even the city of LA, 
has been doing a lot to reimagine what youth development is. And so the work from, um, from Lupe and just even pushing back around like these ideas of what youth of color have experienced have definitely influenced how we now are looking at it, new innovative models for youth development. So that just began with an Instagram profile. So to me, it's just, these projects kind of show the, the ingenuity of folks, the, you know, kind of how much they can be driven by people um, and become much bigger projects that embrace community and, and how community tells their experiences. And, you know, and so then you have, you know, information on Idris and can folks who join us, Christine, Rostin. I think it's, it is important to honor the work that some of these folks are doing um, because you see, you might see us here as facilitators and we'll drop this link in the chat um, as well as email it to you. Um, but there's a lot of expertise here at the table um, that you all can like lean on and, and kind of um, ask us questions. <laughs> I think in many ways we've been through the trenches when it comes to this type of work and with, you know, um, which is why we asked Idris and Christine to join us because they're doing this approach from a different perspective. And um, it might be something that might work here in Santa Monica. It might be something that might generate ideas, if not that specific solution um, itself, um, but it can generate a lot of ideas of what we want um, folks to do. And I think it, it's, it's telling to remind folks that like this process itself that we're facilitating isn't about making decisions, is about helping some Santa Monicans imagine what um, cultural affairs can do to support artists, what cultural affairs can do to support community storytelling, what we can all do collectively to really uplift the stories of, of, of this community in different ways. Like we can tell the same story from 10 different perspectives and that's all valid and we should be doing that. Um, so we'll send out that, that resource um, and we it this will be like an evolving document that we can all kind of contribute to. So if there's other ideas or projects that you all think is important to highlight, please send it to us. Um, and with that, I do want to welcome Idris and Christine to um, you know, <laughs> to this gathering. I don't want to call it an event because I think it's more than that. I think when we call it an event, it becomes very much a transactional thing. This is a gathering. Um, between us and feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, we'll give time and space for Christina and Idris to share their, their work. Um, and then at the end of it, you know, we'll open it up for questions. Um, use the chat as much as possible. I'm gonna drop Idris's bio in the chat. I, not, I, I hate when people read my bio, it just feels super awkward. So I'm not gonna do that to Idris and Christine. But what I will share from Idris is that like the work that they've done um, around augmented reality has really allowed to reimagine what we can do here in Los Angeles. And they worked with a couple folks here in LA, specifically Samantha from the Tongva community to, to kind of uplift some of that. Um, so big props to that. And um, for me, it's important when folks listen, because I want to listen to people, folks when, I, when I'm doing work, I want to make sure that I reflect back to them um, as an artist, what it, what's being communicated to me. So Idris and his team did a great job. Um, and then, you know, Christine's, um, the video that we shared through the Eventbrite, and I think I'll drop that video in here too, um, in the chat, I'm gonna drop Christine's bio. Um, you know, similar to Rossin's work, there's, there's a sensitivity that goes with, you know, gaining people's trust to open up and share their stories with you. And so that aspect of it is, is, is super important in a lot of this work, building trust with folks, even through difficult, conversations, even if we don't agree, but if we trust that they're hearing, we're hearing one another, um, that is super important. So just big props to both of them. And I'm gonna hand this over to Idris and then come back and hand it over to Christine. Take it away, Idris, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Joel. Thank you everybody for having me. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. Um, and I'll, let me just quickly share my screen and then I can get started. Uh, okay. So my name is Idris. Um, I am an artist, educator, creative technologist, and I'm the founder of Kinfolk. Um, Kinfolk, also formerly known as Movers and Shakers. You might see a few things here that say Movers and Shakers, but just know that we've transitioned. Um, but Kinfolk is a tech 
education arts nonprofit. Um, and we create augmented reality experiences, specifically digital monuments centered around black and brown history. So we, I call it an augmented reality archive because we are trying to dig into the past to find counter narratives to the narratives that are being told within our public spaces and our cultural institutions and our schools and find a way to democratize the access to create these, these counter narratives and bring them out uh, to take over these, these spaces that as far as I've seen, have not been presenting as if I belong there. Um, and so Kinfolk, our mission is to uproot oppressive systems and reimagine public spaces through art, emerging technology and storytelling. Our vision is to inspire an equitable future. And so we started in 2017. Um, I, at the time I was working at an education space where I was teaching kids how to learn computer science and art um, specifically through combining those uses to create community solutions for their community. So really design thinking. Um, but at the time on the side, I was a partnering with my partner, Glenn Cantab here, who we were seeing just the story that our city was telling, re realistically the story that we were, we, were te we were told in our schools from young. Um, we weren't learning about our history. We didn't feel like we belonged in our school environment. If we looked in the vast public spaces in New York City, it was a lot of monuments to folks who oppressed us and we didn't see any representation of who we were and so our call to that was to do demonstrations make our voices heard but also create art that challenged the public the story that our public spaces were telling um, and so in 2017 the mayor of new york city mayor de blasio um, they were considering what to do with the columbus circle monument it wasn't a landmark yet people folks were calling for it to be removed Folks were also calling for it to be landmark. And so we were trying to get our voices heard, excuse me, through demonstrations, bringing our community together at the site of Columbus Circle, as well as all around the city to, again, get our voices heard, but also showcase the stories and narratives that are not being told. So we had augmented reality installations that we could bring with us that would highlight the true story of Christopher Columbus and also highlight the stories of the folks that weren't being told at that moment in time. And so for us, it was like inspired by Pokemon Go. And if anyone doesn't know what Pokemon Go is, it was an app where you could walk around the city and Pokemon would exist in certain places and you could play with them, you could catch them. And it was a really innovative way for folks to get out into, the, into public space and play games. And for us, it was like, all right, well, that same technology can also be used to uplift the histories that are being erased constantly around us to give the folks in our communities the ability to counter those stories that are being told. And it was a fast and quick way. Like if we were to actually make installations for our community that were physical, I mean, we'd have to go through the government of the bureaucracy of the government, cultural institutions, and there's a lot of money involved. And for the price of one physical statue, we could create thousands of augmented reality statues that also included narratives from our community, oral histories. I mean, there's a lot of ways that this media, media can, medium could combine um, to properly represent who we were. And so we really are focused on using technology as a way to undo the de dehumanization process that's at the core of the US's collective narratives. And to do that, we need new stories. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And the answers actually for us exist in the ancestral archive. There are folks that really fought for us to be at this space and have paved the way to show us how to move forward. And so this Kinfo can really help us connect with our past to empower our present and to really help us imagine and build that better future. And so we want to provide the tech technological infrastructure to make that possible for allow historical narratives to really change the course of our advocacy efforts around the country. And so quick data, I'm sure a lot of you are already aware, but if we look at the monuments in this country, around 48,000, thanks to the Monument Lab and their national audit, where I got this information from, 48,178 recorded monuments. Um, that's like how many are in existence, but only 240, that's less than 1%, represent people of color. And by contrast, there's, there's actually triple the amount of Confederate monuments in existence today. More are coming down, but that is a great inequity that the systems that are in place currently don't really provide the solution for us to overcome that. And in the same vein, if you look at just critical race theory in our schools, 
I mean, there's efforts in 36 states across the country to restrict the education around how our country was formed, the racial biases that our country has. And this is just showcasing sort of the, the problems with how we, when, not, when we can't challenge and understand our past, that we are not moving forward in, in the correct way and it's actually causing negative consequences. So we're trying to find a solution for that. And we really feel like the solution is by surfacing and sharing our histories as widely as possible, using these histories to create dialogue and support advocacy efforts and really allowing us to imagine and empower our futures, um, but also centering community storytelling above everything. And so this Kinfolk Archive is designed to elevate these voices allow these voices to reach large audiences and really put the power of preserving our histories into our own hands, really taking control over our own narratives. And so in 2021, we finally released it after four years of experimenting. We released Kinfolk with a few monuments and these monuments remain to the black and indigenous figures that were not being talked about. And in the app, we released it during like COVID. And so our original vision was always to bring this out into public spaces, but with COVID, that wasn't as possible. And so we brought it, so made it so that you could bring these monuments into your own house. You could make a gallery space. And for anyone who doesn't know how AR works, it really takes a camera, looks at your physical world, and then digital aspects of digital monuments, 3D models, videos can be placed in that world as if they were there in real life. And so we would allow students, kids, people of all ages to look at monuments, look at these histories in a new way. And a lot of the people who gravitated towards us originally were students uh, and teachers, because they were like, hey, I can bring this into my classroom really easily. And along with looking at the monument, you could read more information about it, look into the archive, look at other videos, other sources that related to the figure and its context. And so we've been creating those ever since. And in 20, in like June of 2021, uh, we were able, actually able to get out into the streets and start experimenting with how we could bring these monuments to life in public space. So we did a walking tour around downtown Manhattan, which is the site of, which is really the hub of where slavery existed in New York City, uh, which is now a large financial center, a lot of a lot of condos. And so we wanted to use Kinfolk to really uplift the history that existed before. And so we had our chance to do a walking tour. So I'm gonna play a video for a minute and so you can see how that went. On Juneteenth, 2021, movers and shakers came back outside. In partnership with Tribeca Festival and Onyx Studios, we held our AR walk to explore virtual monuments. The Kinfolk app brought black history to life with interactive AR models. We realized that with augmented reality, we could put up our own statues, and that's how people were born. The event started at Netherland Monument in Battery Park. This monument commemorates when the Dutch stole this land from the Lenny Lenape people. Then we went to the former site of the New York Slave Market, then to the George Washington statue at Federal Hall. I'm a descendant of George Washington. Think about for a second how that came to be. We ended the day at Washington Square Park as part of the Knight Riders Juneteenth tour. With Kinfolk, we're really trying to unearth these histories that clearly our city is trying to bury. We're just getting started. More monuments to come. So this point for us was really exciting because we really got to see the impact of how this technology and the stories we were telling at these specific sites really were getting people's imaginations going. Um, and it just showed the power that we have to take control of our own public spaces and put our own narratives within those spaces. And so from there, we really provide, create a sort of an action network in terms of how we can get these stories out there. But more importantly, how do we build these stories in a way that are focused on community, highlighting these community stories that are important to them and translating that into a way that's accessible for folks to listen to. And so for us, we're a group of activists, educators, historians, and artists. And we tend to collaborate with a bunch of different folks. We collaborate with the general public. I think there's a lot of museums and heritage sites that have information that is gate kept. And we have worked with a few institutions to get that information out into these public spaces. Schools, again, have been a large part of this, or, uh, of, of this work, but also the, the biggest one for us is the community organizations. In order for us to create a monument, we'd like to go to these community organizations and poll their community to see who they want to create, what narratives are important to them, 
And then we can work with those communities and artists and historians within those communities to translate that to an augmented reality space that can be really accessible. And so one of the projects um, that I was want to talk about is one we're doing in Brooklyn. It was called about the Flatbush Ancestral Burial Grounds. And so one of our community partners, um, Grow House NYC, they were able to discover along with a few other orgs, a parking lot, I mean, a uh, empty lot in New York that actually had, was a burial ground. It had bones of enslaved Africans that were discovered. And yet the city was in a place where they were actually trying to build apartment complexes on top of this. They were already actively putting out RFPs. And so in order to combat that, the community needed to get their narratives out there. And so they created a walking tour around Flatbush, Brooklyn, that highlighted the rich history of Black folks who lived there, Indigenous folks who lived there, the interplay and collaboration between the Indigenous and Black communities that really a lot of people in Brooklyn don't even hear about. And so for us, we came in and actually, one, provided some ways to visualize these histories that were being talked about so people could access the monuments of these folks that were talked about on the tour, but also provided a way that people could engage with these histories after um, the tour was over. So just to make it accessible in general at all times. So if people wanted to know who was here, they could easily they could easily access that. And so um, I think someone is off mute, but I think that's fine. Um, but yeah, so I think that was a really a perfect representation of how we like to work with different community organizations. We talk to them, see what see what narratives are, they, they are important to them. And then we bring that into a community in, into kinfolk. And so other ways that we do it is that when we go to community, like in LA, we went, we did a whole event. We did an event in downtown LA in Grand Park. And through that event, we were able to also poll the community on who they would want to see represented and also where these, these representations should take place. So we really wanted to center community storytelling and community decision-making in all of the monuments and decisions that we're trying to make with kinfolk. And we also collected these this data with through our app, as well as when we do installations at museums and art spaces, we always have a participatory nature to them where people can make their own suggestions. And for us as an archive, I think we're trying to flip it, flip the model on its head. And a lot of times with archives, it starts at the top, where scholars are the ones, scholars, universities, institutions are deciding what information is deemed important enough to be considered within an archive. A lot of those archives are paywalled, um, are physical archives that are hard to access. Some of them are free and accessible. Um, and then after the archive is filled with stuff that the scholars deem is important, then it's made accessible to communities. And again, sometimes it's not even accessible. But I think for us, we want to flip that on its head and give the community the power to decide what's important and what needs to be archived and can actively contribute to that. And then it, and then the archive can be accessible to other folks to use in many different means. But the power of archive and memory making should be in our own hands. Black and brown communities have had to take this in their own hands for centuries. And so technology is just the next step to make that process more accessible and easier for a lot of folks to create some sort of permanence um, in, in our histories and in our narratives. And so for me, I envision the future of Kinfolk to be a living archive of the diaspora and AR can be the tool that can connect communities to our stories through immersive storytelling. And so the next phase for us, it's we built out this application that has archived this history that's really only able to engage in your own space because of COVID. And so the next phase for us is location-based technology, using that Pokemon Go situation to, so that people can go to a monument that exists and see a counter monument that is exists in there really easily. And so that's really what we're in the, in the um, right now that's where we're in the process of releasing. And our goal is to be able to activate spaces across the, across the cities that we're in so that not only we can collaborate with communities to be able to tell these stories and, and place them in certain locations, but that so that that opportunity is available to everyone. And so we really feel like AR can be the connector um, to allow folks to bring their stories into these spaces very easily. Um, and so with this location-based technology, 
we can work really, it's like a whole new avenue for artists, activists, community organizations to engage with their stories. But also it's sort of a new medium, like digital public art is something that could not really have existed 10, 15 years ago. And we really want to take advantage of this space and this medium to put Black and Brown stories, Black and Brown communities on the forefront and as visible as possible where it makes sense. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that the, we want to make it accessible in these spaces and at certain locations, but also the power of the technology is that where these information can also be brought, ubiquitously brought into classrooms so that students can learn really from the communities that are telling these histories. And so we really see an avenue where we're making work, putting it out into the public spaces, and that work can be used in many different forms, in schools and in informal learning environments, at home. And so we really want to make this information as accessible as possible and center community um, throughout. So um, I've been talking for a minute, so I'm going to stop now. But that's 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 what I have. I would love to hear y'all's thoughts on what I'm doing here. Um, so yeah, I'll stop. Awesome. Thank you, Idris. If you have questions, please drop them in the chat so we can capture them. I know we have a couple of questions there, but we're going to keep moving on to Christine um, and I'm going to pass it off to Robin. Yeah, so next we're going to hear from Christine Wong Yap, um, who's an incredible artist. Um, and I think Rustin, I'm sorry, Hoel just put um, her uh, bio in the chat and um, yeah, we'll just hand it over to you, Christine. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Thanks for the invitation for Hoel and Robin for inviting me. And thanks to all y'all for being here. Um, I think this is such an interesting topic and um, such a necessary one. Um, it's a really exciting terrain, actually, to be figuring this out. So thank you for doing the work. Um, I think you're seeing my screen, yeah? Okay. Let me, oh, not yet. Okay, here we go. All right, so yeah, so my name is Christine Wang Yap. My pronouns are she, but they also works. And I am coming to you from my studio in Oakland, which is in Huchin, which is the unceded territory of the Ohlone. So I'm a visual artist and social practitioner. Um, social practice is concerned with the aesthetics of the social. So sometimes social practice can be almost identical to community-based art. And sometimes my projects are pretty similar to participatory research or inclusive design processes. In addition to social practice and community engagement, I also work in drawing and lettering, printmaking and publications and public art, including um, mixed media like flags and banners, like this one you see, whoops, behind me. <laughs> um, I explore, uh, through my work, I explore subjective well being and positive psychology. Positive psychology is an empirical study of um, what people do to increase or maintain their subjective well being. And subjective well being is the affective, with an A, um, people's affective evaluations of their own lives. Um, so I'm going to share a project with you that I did a few years ago, and if there's more time, I will share um, a little bit more, depending on how we uh, how it goes. So um, a few years ago, I was um, an artist, a lead artist on this project with Chinese Culture Center of San Francisco, which is a mouthful, so you'll hear me say CCC instead. Um, they're uh, rooted in the San Francisco Chinatown and Manila Town neighborhood, um, which is uh, in the Ramaytush homeland. Um, so CCC was interested in a community engagement process to help lay the groundwork for a coalition of arts and culture organizations in order for them to apply for cultural district designation, which would open the door to more funding from San Francisco, from the city. And we kind of created a project which centered around this one main question. How does art and culture impact your sense of belonging in San Francisco Chinatown? 
So um, in preparing for this talk, Robin asked me to think about what were some of the challenges in my projects. And I would say, I think outreach has historically been one of the biggest challenges for me. And what has helped is actually over the years I've gotten, the process has gotten easier and it's not that I've gotten better at outreach, it's that I've gotten better at partnering with organizations which have strong ties to the community and who also have champions within the organization who can champion the project. Um, for this project, I was actually living in New York City at the time. So ironically, um, I know a lot of Idris's initial slides were at Columbus Circle, which is funny because I used to work at the Museum of Art and Design, which is right on Columbus Circle. So I know that area oh. super well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, so yeah, so at the time I was living in New York City and then it was the pandemic happened and then shelter in place happened. So I was not able to come out here to the Bay Area to do engagement in person. A lot of it had to be done remotely. So luckily I was partnered up with the coalition of community-based organizations and they engaged their constituents. And we did it by asking people to respond to questionnaires which were available in English and Chinese on paper and also online. And that actually did set a pretty high bar for participation and limited the pools of contributors who could offer input. Um, but I have done other projects in the, in the year, intervening years and gotten more, I think, in-depth engagement through direct interviews and Zoom meetings and, and phone calls and things like that. Um, I think just during the pandemic um, and the way I was working then, that was kind of like an earlier way of working that I've since figured out how to move on from. So here's one page from the questionnaire and you can see that we're asking people to identify the sources of their belonging. It might be a person, a place, an activity and so on. Here's another page that's filled out. We ask people about their top three favorite activities, how it enriches their lives, because again, I'm really interested in the affective and people's like emotional responses. And then also because I'm trying to get more at the systemic, we ask what system structures, policies and practices support those um, favorite art and culture activities. So I've done previous projects on belonging like this one, which is a book that resulted from a residency project that I did with the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. Um, so this one's very text intensive, but Chinatown, of course, is mostly immigrants who tend to have lower education levels than the rest of San Francisco. So instead of a book that had a lot of reading, I thought a better way to present the work is through a 56 page comic book. And I titled it Alive and Present, Cultural Belonging in San Francisco, Chinatown and Manila Town. And it's fully bilingual thanks to CCC being really culturally competent and hiring a lot of folks on staff who are bilingual, who could provide the bilingual support for this project. So I'm gonna share a couple of learnings from this project. And the first one is just in the framing. So initially I said it was about San Francisco Chinatown, but actually as the stories came in and I realized it was important to acknowledge historic Manila town, which no longer exists in that geographic area, a lot of the Filipino community has been dispersed to different neighborhoods in San Francisco, but it's important to carry on the legacy because it's a story of eviction, gentrification, and resistance. And it's about honoring that fight for continuity and belonging. So inside the comic book, you'll find three types of pages. Uh, the first one are these illustrated maps of places of belonging. Um, and there's three different maps, each one uh, for a different uh, north-south thoroughfare. So like Kearney, Stockton, Grant Street. Um, and I know in this kind of realm, a lot of people talk about creative place making. And as I worked on this project, I actually think um, this kind of thing is cultural asset mapping. And it's really about creative place knowing. Like, I'm not bringing anything new. I'm just acknowledging what's already there. Um, and so you'll see on all the pages that there's different figures who are drawn and then there's speech bubbles and all the text in the speech bubbles are direct quotes from real people, whether they're residents, workers or visitors to Chinatown. 
So I mentioned three different types of pages. The second type are street scenes like this. And the reason I created a lot of street scenes is when we started the project, we asked people about art and culture. And some people talked about galleries, but for the most part, a lot of people talked about culture that you can encounter just walking down the street. So like this page is about hearing certain kinds of instruments or just hearing people sing karaoke in the alleyways where people talked about the comfort of hearing your native dialect or coming across a specific ingredients that you use to make cultural dishes that you might not find at your Safeway or, or Vons in LA. <laughs> so that's why the comic book um, has a subtitle specifically about cultural belonging. Um, Another thing that was very educational for me was like how much this project turned out to be about urbanism. So I learned that San Francisco Chinatown is actually the densest neighborhood in the US after Manhattan. So when tourists or visitors come and they stumble upon like a lion dance rehearsal when they're waiting in line to go to the, the famous fortune cookie factory that they read about in the tourist book, that sense of serendipity or adventure Part of it is because there's a lack of public space. There's a lack of private space and then people have to use public space in a more vibrant way that kind of makes Chinatown a model of urbanism. But it also means the residents of Chinatown are like role models of resourcefulness and resiliency. Um, another thing that I realized is like, I did a lot of um, drawing from, um, photo references. I used photo references from Chinatown as much as I possibly could. And thankfully, Chinatown is very photogenic, so it's very easy to find photo references, even when you're looking online from New York. Um, so when I made the comic book and people said, I know that lamppost, that's a very iconic lamppost for San Francisco Chinatown, or I know that mural, I used to live in the SRO that that mural is painted on, it had a different kind of resonance um, that was very specific. And it made me think like all these things, these, these sights, sounds, tastes, smells, and textures that people said evoked memories for them in this kind of potent way. If it brought back a grandma who's no longer alive or like them being a child, even if it's 50 years ago, in a way it's like, kind of like a memory palace, only like Chinatown is not a memory palace that you build in your head. Chinatown is a memory palace that you can walk through. So the third type of content in the comic book are these longer first person narratives. And they're usually told from one person's perspective, but interestingly, many of them are about intergenerational relationships and love. So I think this reflects the fact that many of the residents of Chinatown tend to be either recent immigrants or elders who, for whatever reason, have not, um, their language abilities and like need for social resources keep them in this neighborhood. So while their kids might move away to the suburbs and the grandkids look, are born and raised in the suburbs, they keep coming back and associate this um, neighborhood with this intergenerational relationship. So I think it was also important to tell this story to save the I Hotel, which is a seminal point in Asian American activism. And luckily that came through in a bunch of the uh, narratives. And we published the comic book in October of 2020. So because of the pandemic, even though I had access to this really cool um, neighborhood gallery situated in one of the alleyways, instead of installing something indoors, because there was like no vaccinations back then. We just um, had only a storefront installation so people could come by and be safe. Um, so people could see images on the monitor of the comic book in English and Chinese, and then pick up copies of the zines. We really wanted to have local residents get a lot of copies. Um, so they were here for free. And then we also distributed a bunch of copies, like 300 or something like that to the local community through our community partners and also at health clinics and waiting rooms. Um, I also made a map where I put all of the places of belonging that people had mentioned into one map that I hope people would take on like a self-guided walking tour. 
Um, you know, I think all the restaurants and businesses of San, Fr of San Francisco Chinatown were really hit hard. I mean, everybody was hit hard during the pandemic, but I think very early in the pandemic, people stopped going to Chinatowns really early because of fear of the virus coming from China. Um, so um, I think in my own way, if I was able to do anything to support local businesses or to get people to come to Chinatown, um, that was like something that I hoped that this uh, self-guided walking tour would do. Um, we did have a soft launch and we, instead of us buying food, we just gave drink tickets to the boba shop across the alleyway and you know the comic books were printed by a copy shop like one alleyway over the vinyl for the window was done um, from a sign shop one block up on Stockton Street so I think um, you know keeping the money in the neighborhood is actually another way to foster engagement um, with your project um, so as far as things that worked well I think having community partners with strong roots is really good. Um, Chinese Culture Center is deeply rooted in the neighborhood and they are also part of an ecosystem of service agencies that are very collaborative. Um, and then having champions within the organization is really helpful. Having that cultural competence and language ability is really important. Um, I think having a sense of humility and openness is really good, like being able to adapt anything in your project, whether it's the framing of even what you think your project is and who is involved. Um, so having a sense of, it's hard because as an artist, people are always like, what is your final outcome gonna be? They want you to tell them from the very beginning before you even do it, like, I'm gonna make this, this or that, but then, as you learn like, oh, maybe a book with all this text is not the right thing. Maybe it needs to be a picture. Um, so all these different things. So keeping it open-ended, I think is really helpful. So I think I've been talking for about um, 13 minutes. If you wanna learn more, I have more on my website, but I also, I feel like I learned so much since I did this project. Is it okay if I share a few more things? Okay. I see not. All right. So this um, banner, sorry, this banner behind me is from um, this project that I did at the Library Foundation of LA with the LA Public Library. And I did a bunch of interviews and phone calls and meetings and site visits with seven different clubs and affinity groups that meet at different library branches around LA. And then I created banners to commemorate them. So what you see on the left side are the names of the clubs and on the right side is a quote from a member of the club, either a facilitator or sometimes there's like a volunteer for the literacy program, like a tutor and then a student or a learner. Here's like a detail of that um, adult literacy one. So the top one is from a, a volunteer tutor or teacher and the bottom one is from a learner. Um, and then I, collected a lot of the text and compiled them into a zine. So it's telling the story of what makes these places, places of belonging in people's own words. Mm -hmm. And then there's this one more project I have to talk about because I have been continuing to partner with Chinese Culture Center. Um, and I've just um, been wrapping up, sorry, the dates are wrong. It's actually last year to this year. It's still happening anyway. Um, so what I wasn't able to do in that first project is to get people in the room together. So it's been really cool that this project has really been about cross-cultural bridging. So what we did is we invited 16 immigrant working class women. Half of them are Spanish speakers from the Mission District and half are Chinese speakers from Chinatown. And we got them in the room together to talk about their experiences and talk about their own sources of resilience. And then we did some design workshops and then they created flags to represent their sources of resilience. It was super hard to do trilingual workshops. Um, so it was definitely a stretch project for me. Um, but then we marched our flags in the Chinese New Year Parade on February 4th. Um, the Chinese New Year Parade has been one of the longest um, parades outside of China. 
uh, for Chinese New Year. And um, the parade organizer told us that we were the first contemporary art project to march in this parade. And it's been, the parade's been first started in 1851. Um, so, I'm super proud of this project. And um, there's an exhibition that's on at Chinese Culture Center through August 4th, if you happen to be coming through San Francisco. I just like to mention the fact that a lot of arts institutions do this thing where they'll work with an artist one time and they'll be like, that artist is done. We can't work with them for another five or 10 years. So for, um, an arts organization to continue to have this engagement sustained over time so that we can continue to foster these relationships in the community. That's something very special. So I'm very grateful. All right, I'll stop talking now. Thank you both Idris and Christine. Amazing work, amazing work. And I'm glad that we were able to bring you, bring you out to bring you out on Zoom <laughs> to share your work. Um, we do, I mean, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and, and we do have a couple questions and I have a question for Christine. Um, Idris from, from Stephanie, and this sounds very much like um, Jeopardy or whatever. Um, can you talk about the temporal nature of the medium and the different ways that people of different generations um, access the technology? Um, and then follow-up question to that is, did your actions in Flatbush change the process for the city? Well, I mean, yeah, I think there's definitely, the great thing about the AR medium is that it is dynamic. It's not static. It can shift over time. If folks want to change what's at a current site, that's definitely possible. And it can exist in multiple different temporalities. Like if one, if there's a monument of someone you want to exist in one space, there's no reason that history is also relevant to other spaces. And so I like how dynamic it is, which offers something really different than building physical monuments. Um, but I also think that the importance is also to combine this work with the physical nature as well. It's not like digital or physical, but there's a way that they exist together, um, which I think is, is, is really interesting. Um, and so what was, can you repeat that first question? Um, what, what is the temporal nature of the medium and different ways that different generations can access the technology? Well, I mean, yeah, the technology is the same for every everybody. It is available publicly on the app store. You download it to your phone, Android, iOS, what, Apple, whatever phone you have, it works for that device. Um, we're really lucky to be at a moment in time where AR is capable to run on most devices. I would say five years ago when we started that, started this, that, that was not the case. It ran on like a few generations of iPhones and a few Androids if we were lucky. And so I think we're at a really great space where it's really accessible. And I mean, really, we have a very multi-generational approach to how we build out the app and who we have at these spaces. And I think what's been great for me is to see, first off, kids, they, I feel like they they are augmented reality. Like they take the they take they take the device and they know how to do everything. Um, but I think that also older generations have been it, it's, a, it's a learning curve for sure. But once that learning once like with a few minutes of playing around with it, it becomes something that has been at that is accessible. And so I've seen. I mean, my grandmother still does struggle with the app a little bit, but I think that it's it's great to see it's still accessible and folks really do understand how to use it. And I feel like we have a certain relationship with the device. We're used to using it in, in a certain way, but the way AR works, it really moves us back to how we're in, used to engaging with our physical world. It's 3D, it's spatial. Um, so um, I've just been really glad to see how all generations at our events and our community or at our community events have been reacting and using it. And I think also QR codes with the pandemic, people understand QR codes and things of that nature. And that really helps orient folks with the technology. Um, and the second question is the Flatbush uh, question. And yes, the work did stop the government, the um, the work did stop the uh, city from building um, apartment complexes. There's no more RFPs on that. But then it's the second phase of the problem is that they've now given the uh, the, the um, burial ground to uh, under the control of the parks department. 
And so now the parks department is trying to build basketball courts. And Mayor Adams came in and said he was going to talk to the community to see how we could improve community decision-making around the burial ground. But Mayor Adams is nowhere to be found at the community meetings. And so there's still more work to be done. And so the next phase is trying to talk to the parks department, trying to get Congress, congressmen and women to advocate for the community to gain control over this. Um, and another part of that's the advocacy efforts are gonna continue happen to the spring. And a lot of the work for us is now getting the community to reimagine and bring proposals together for what that space could be and then present that um, to, the, to the parks department. So there's a lot more advocacy efforts coming up in the spring and the fight isn't over. There's no more, no more apartment complexes being built but the fight, the fight is still going. Thank you. Um, first of all, like, I just want to say like you Santa Monica folks are super lucky that um, Santa Monica is undertaking something of this nature. I just want to say that I wish LA County did this and I wish other cities did it. And Santa Monica is a little bit ahead of the game with this, that like you're thinking through what and how you want to tell these stories. So like just major props to the city for doing this. Um, a question for Christine, and this is from Rostin. If you can talk a bit about how people from the communities you worked with reacted to seeing the um, their their work installed and distributed and, and presented to the public. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question, Rostin. Um, I think it, it's it's been really cool. Just to me, that is like the most meaningful part. So, like you know, like. It's nice when like curators and stuff come or blah blah blah. But then when like the people who come who are part of those like clubs and affinity groups in LA like come from like all the way the other side of, of the county to and then they're like, oh wow, that's us. And they want to take photos of it or like be like, no, no, take another one <laughs> that's better with me and this, you know, then it's like that's like what's really validating and meaningful to me. Like that's like, okay, I did good with this, you know. Um, in the Chinatown project, I would hear from like people who like, I'm there's like one person whose narrative is in there. And she talked about her relationship with her grandmother and how she volunteered with this like social club. And she went and she's like, I would love to get one for every um, member of the club, you know, and then in other projects that I've done where it was with seniors in Times Square, there's like some elders who were like, um, you know, my grandkids were not that interested in me, but this is kind of making them pay more attention to me and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, just like the kind of like different little micro ways that this plays out for people is just like, those things are really like heartwarming for me. Um, I think like the longer term, like social stuff that changes also like, it's interesting how it will happen. Like, First we had the soft launch and then we we met the the owner of the bobo shop because we want, bought the drink tickets and then later he was like you know it started to get more people to come out and um and then he actually it's taken a couple of years but he actually started to like take more community ownership over the the alleyway and then he started painting murals in the alleyway and then he started doing more things in the fair where like he makes these like little um like toys like that are like mechanical toys and he would take them out during the community fair so that kids could play with them and um I think that kind of sense of like these are very like slow burn like it took three years to like develop this relationship with Mr. Huang you know but um I think that's it it takes that much sometimes you know thank you um Danielle do you want to come off mute and um, ask your question. Um, I know you have it listed here as like, how how about combining, and this is both to Idris and Christine, how about combining what you both are doing on a viewer? Can you kind of elaborate a little bit? Um, <clears throat> I can try. I just, uh, it was really a feeling, to be honest, of loving both of their work and their approaches and applications. And I just thought, how could this be one project that can be shown on a site where people can watch it almost like the old Nickelodeon theaters where but you know obviously new technology but uh but combining those things so these statues are moving and they're telling a story and they're moving you from it so you don't just get a, a flat wall or a flat photo where people are 
then having to add that narrative to it. You're getting the whole thing in one, one package and it takes you quite a long, like a film, but more, more sort of uh, stop animation. Um, and I, I love both these things. I think they're just great. You know, it's so exciting to see it all and the possibilities of all of it are just huge. So I just see one as a very a grassroots uh, um, approach using uh, the the comic, the 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 storytelling, and the other one as a very dynamic uh, uh, presence of, of a huge dynamic. And you cannot deny or run from this presence. So I say, well, why not mix them up? But I I don't I'm 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 able to log on to your Zoom, and that's about my technical experience. <laughs> And I, uh, it, but I just, my mind just took it there. So I thought I'd just throw it out there. Beautiful. I mean, yeah, I, Go ahead. I get a sense of what you're asking, but Idris and Kat, Christine to, yeah, respond to that. I could try. I mean, I definitely had a similar thought when I was watching the presentation and I feel like um, the AR is, the physical work is its own beautiful thing. And the AR can also maybe extend the work, animate the work. I mean, there's ways that the app also can recognize images and make those images move, bring those images, 3D images come out of the pages. And so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that it could be combined. Um, and thinking about where maybe media, audio, video, where that play, where that could play into the project, um, it was, would always be a good place for AR to come in and help out. But um, I had a similar thought as you. Um, and I think I think it would be great. <laughs> yeah, I think I I what I really love about Idris's work or Kim Folks's work is like just it the um you know like public art for artists is like a pain in the butt. Like a lot of public a lot of artists I know don't want to apply to public art things just because the application is too annoying. Much less like the five year process of going getting it approved, getting this vendor, blah de blah, the engineering, the permit, blah, 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 blah. Like um, so like being able to do things that's more like uh quick and like um just like not like waiting for permissions and just being able to do stuff very quickly. I think that's like the really, really cool aspect of like this AR work is like you don't need anybody's permission. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, like doing a more involved install in some ways is like possible, but then also like what, I don't know, like what, like what all, I don't know, like how, <laughs> I don't know how it'll all work, but I do feel like Christoph Ujiko did a lot of stuff like that, where he would do projection mapping on existing statues, but yeah. it was more like video work. Um, so that's, Kind of something maybe kind of similar to what might be um Danielle might be envisioning. Let me see. I, I can see I can find something. I will put it in the chat. Um I saw what I saw was let's say I walk up to the murals in the city hall and you choose to do whatever with them, what whatever application changes. But then there's a, a a thing there where I can turn it on and or it's running and it sucks me right into the whole story from start to start to now. And you're just taken right along. So it's not only educational, but it's art and it's it's also transitional. It's it's this happened, but they said this, but this is really this and this is what happened. And now we're here and, you know, et cetera. So with the application being so exciting of what Idris is doing, um, you can do all that. It's almost like multi-paneled, you know, that this person, you know, like four kids telling different stories, but uh, but then it, it meshes into where we are. So I, I just I just love this. I just think it's so exciting. I think you're both terrific. So now I'll shut up. <laughs> okay. um, Kathleen, you had a question. You know, this actually answered my question because I was going to ask, what are some of the things that we could do to help influence this upcoming artistic culture where the stories are being told by community members in Santa Monica? Granted, we're ahead of the curve and God bless our city and our, our Department of Cultural Affairs. But the truth of it is sometimes they get downplayed to a report. 
That's just what happens. And so I would really love to be able to make this, all this work and all this energy and all this creativity, something more than that. And what comes to mind is maybe with the report, we have a interactive artistic answer that includes leaving it the same and projecting some activity. Maybe the first people actually stand up and tell the story. So now I've said it. <laughs> there you go, Kathleen. I, I'm, I'm going to build off of that because I think the work that Idris and, and Christine are doing and, and how they're sharing it is, is really important, I think, in regards to the expectations that might come from artists who might respond to this work in some in some way. Um, and I know Lizette has her hand raised. Um, if you can talk a little bit about values and your approach to the work. I know, Christine, you mentioned belonging a lot. And I think it's very, to me, it's very different than the term equity and inclusion that gets used a lot by a lot of cities, right? They're just starting to accept or try to do equity and inclusive work. But I think the framing of belonging is a much more powerful and accessible term for community members to like engage with. Um, and what I hear from both of you as well is, is you're not talking about the work as like, this is my work as an artist, I'm doing this, but like you both act as a conduit from community energy and, and ideas, very much like what Danielle is sharing, and how with your own skill set manifest those things into the real world. Um, so just see if you can respond to those two things so that the folks here know exactly what to expect from artists when it comes to um, this type of work. <laughs> well, I would just say, I think like equity and inclusion, it can, it's more like hard science, whereas like belonging is a little squishy because it is rooted in a feeling. And actually, when you first talk to people about it, a lot of people don't know where they belong, but they know where they don't belong. And so it's more like it, it can sometimes start with that feeling of, of disbelonging to get into the feeling of what is belonging. So I think it is like a little bit it's it's more abstract in some ways because it connects on a personal level with also systems level. Um, I think like as far as um, just ways of working with artists, I really, really, really love the municipalartist.org website. It's municipal hyphen artist. Um, they've done a ton of work looking at um, municipal artists and residencies, um, which I think Tom Finkelpearl started as a cultural commissioner in New York City based on um, mural Letterman Ukele's work in the New York Department of Sanitation. But I think cities around the country are starting to develop these municipal residencies. And it sounds like, you know, I, what, I feel like sometimes I'm like, do we really need more bronze statues, you know? And like, can we just continue to have like these artworks that generate dialogue and just allow for this emergent thing rather than a static thing? that is the kind of this complete um, non-interactive statement, you know? I mean, yeah, for me, the work stemmed from a lack of belonging, like looking around, just constantly not feeling and belonging in any spaces that I was in. And I was trying to find a way using the skills that I had to actively counteract that. And I know that I'm, I'm not alone in feeling that way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean the belonging is 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 is, is definitely extremely important. Um, I was gonna say something else, but I forgot what that was. Um, damn, I forgot what it was. Sorry. Well, jump in whenever. But I know Lizette had their hand raised. Lizette, do you want to come off mute? Yes. Uh, and I know that feeling is so many ideas, right? And the flow is on. I also um, just am really grateful for hearing both of you um and what what you're offering like i really love for example um either you see what you're sharing with like the reverse of the triangle and how to like really what i'm kind of sensing is like popularizing um and you know augmenting the the access to the different modalities of art right and um that now exist and i also yeah just all the different avenues that this can go and at the same time, you know, what we're dealing with here in, in Santa Monica, uh, and I'm not in Santa Monica at the moment, but, you know, with that mural and, and, and the um, focus on indigenous body folks, and in particular Tongva nation folks, and how, you know, um, northern native folks often get mm -hmm. left out and, 
and yes. uh, and even here, right? Like we just have a very limited number of of top <laughs> represented folks that can actually already belong to this process, right? Or be part of this process and naming this. So um, I appreciate what you were sharing, Christine, about how you were honoring the history of Filipino town within the larger history of Chinatown. Like that's the kind of um, different layers that, you know, of complexity that we're looking to address. Um, so I don't know if I have a question, but I just, you know, as an organizer, as, as um as someone that just works in different communities as an urban planner all that i just feel like it just really resonates and at the end of the day we just we got to ask the tongva folks you know um that are here today you know and beyond thank you lizette um we're at 7 21. i know this conversation go on for another hour um any last questions before we close out I know Rawson, you had a couple questions in the chat, but I know they've kind of been answered and you're like, no, 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 shaking your head. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, anyone else? I, I I have questions, but I'll hold them. And if you don't have any thoughts, just like feel free to come off mute and you know just share some thoughts. Um, I, know, I, like, I, I, I'd like to just say one thing to kind of wrap wrap it up, and I really appreciate um you know, you're sharing your work, Christine and Idris. And I want to also just say that like um, a lot of the interventions and creative ways that folks are responding to um, uh, monuments and contested histories um, in this country also have relationships to what's been happening outside of this country for a long period of time. And there's many, many projects and things that have been happening on a global scale um, that I think are really worth kind of acknowledging too. And definitely um, a lot of the kind of ways that we're kind of pushing back against official narratives in this country has to also be in conversation with like um, the ways that, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, work against um, imperialist forces abroad have been operating at the same time. And there's always been this historical conversation that's happened, both in terms of like, um, you know, artistic pushes against those things in the U.S. Uh, with um, artistic pushes against those things abroad. And in our original thinking about this program, one of the ideas that we had was kind of bringing in some of those more international examples, like in Venezuela, the, the Columbus statue was taken down many, many years before that was even part of the conversation in the United States. And there's like a huge mural movement um, to kind of call on um, indigenous heroes and people's heroes um, in Venezuela during the period of time that there was a huge political change kind of beginning in 1998. But, um, and those kinds of processes abroad have always been happening and and in, in many ways we're in, in a lot of conversation with those. And hopefully this is um, a place to kind of spark um, some inspiration of things that are actually happening here, but also know that we're in a much bigger, larger global process around changing the narrative and who gets to tell the story of us, right? So, um, and how do we use these creative capacities to tell that story in a way that it hasn't been told before? So we're definitely part of some really exciting work in Santa Monica, which is part of some really exciting work in this country, which is part of some really exciting work that's happening all over the place that predates us. So just to know there's so many examples that we can draw from actually. I'm um, in thinking about how do we be creative and in, in doing this work and hopefully the kind of guide that we'll share is one step but we'll, we can continue to share like other things um, that are happening all over the globe. Awesome, thank you. I am going to see if I can find or if Naomi has a link for April, our April 1st event. Um, which will continue this type of work with Anu Yadav and and um, center the the ability to use storytelling as a way of of um, bringing people together. Um, it is in person and it is outdoors. And I think I found the link. Give me one second. I'll drop it in the chat. And if you haven't heard about this event yet, please feel free to sign up now. <laughs> um, so that's coming up April 1st. 
again, like this, this series of programs is meant to bring resources to you all, to give you tools to um, figure out what it is that you all think should happen in Santa Monica in response to not just the mural. The mural is obviously one um, launch point for these conversations, but we've heard from you all that like expanding how artists are supported is important. Um, so we hope that these are ideas that can help generate more ideas for you all. Um, so thank you for joining us. It This was exciting. It's one of the, you know, um, it was fun for me as just like an artist and nerding out on the work of Idris and Christine. So I hope that you also enjoyed it and have a good evening and stay dry and warm. <laughs> have a good one. Thank hope you feel so better, much. Joel. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Blessings, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.